Greg Roberts. We're going to be talking about the South Bay real estate market. Hey guys, Alex with Bay Cities Construction. Welcome to the Bay Cities Construction Show. Today in our studio, we have our good friend Greg Roberts with Coldwell Banker. We're going to be talking about real estate today. We're going to be talking about the markets. Greg's going to give us his report uh, of 2022 and his predictions for 20 for the rest of 2022 and, and into 2023. We're also going to cover our tips, trivia, and our Q&A at the end of the show, like always. So we've got some really good info. Let's get into it with uh, our good friend, Greg Roberts. Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, about the territory you work, and uh, let the audience know a little bit more about you. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I started in 2003, went full-time right away. So I've been working now almost 20 years in the field. And I started on the west side, moved over to the South Bay while I lived in the South Bay. My uh, area was the west side for the first five or six years. Moved to the South Bay in 2008, 2009. Um, been doing the South Bay ever since, but when the market crashed in 2007, I transitioned and did a lot of short sales and foreclosure activity, which led to me really broadening my area. So I've done deals as far as south as San Diego, as far north as into Ventura, but I basically do the South Bay down to maybe Long Beach, that area there. Um, Typically, I'll do all kinds of residential real estate. I have done some commercial deals as well. Uh, investors, flippers, multi-unit buildings. But the mainstay would be residential single-family home and single-family uh, condos. Right on. Cool. So, you know, it says here that um, I got some information that you actually really like architecture. You're a fan of architecture and design. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, love it. I studied it in high school and somewhat in college. And I think that led to me wanting to get into real estate to be more of a developer. And uh, as I started to really learn more about real estate and get into it, um, I realized, you know, I think I can do pretty well with uh, helping folks buy and sell as well. So, um it is something I really enjoy. It comes through when I'm helping sellers sell their property. I can point out different facets of the home, but also with buyers and helping them get excited about what's the fit for them. Well, I, I think as as we're looking at um, at an aging market, mm -hmm. the, a lot of the houses here, especially here in the South Bay, have been built around the 1950s, right? So right. there's a lot of things to, to update as the boomers kind of cycle out. Right. Meaning they die, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. So let's talk a little bit about um, like a typical listing down here in the South Bay. We've mm -hmm. got um, we got a couple little slides here of some of these properties that it, I guess you've sold. Mm -hmm. On Elm Street, looks mm -hmm. like a uh, single-story deal in Manhattan Beach. Yeah, this was a, uh, a smaller home in Manhattan Beach, but on a great lot. Uh, single-story. Uh, had a lot of really... Uh, kind of older characteristics. They kept a lot of the wood beam ceilings. Um, you know, and while the roof is line isn't that high, it follows it on the inside. You have kind of some classic features throughout. And when it was remodeled, they enhanced those features and brought everything else into that same vein uh, while keeping it kind of over the same period. Now, the, the second home that we have on this slide, this is a very common setup here in the South Bay for mm -hmm. those folks that are in L.A., in greater, greater L.A., you don't see that that often, but right. down here it's very common from all the way from Manhattan Beach down to, to, to South Torrance. Yeah, especially right. in Redondo Beach. Especially in Redondo um, Beach, yeah. You'll see quite a few two on a lots or three on a lots. This was a brand new construction in Redondo Beach. There were three on a lot. And uh, unit C, the back unit, had a nice little yard. Um, but all of the modern features that people really want to see that you don't always get in those 1945 to 55 period homes that we had talked about, um, you know, grand, basically large open spaces, high ceilings, uh, really great for entertaining. Yeah. So this is, this is a, an example. The inside of that one has a, mm -hmm. a really nice open floor plan. Yeah. Exactly. Which is pretty much what everybody wants, what they, what everybody's wanted over the last seven years. Mm -hmm. Real nice kitchen, nice layout. Mm -hmm. Hey, was this house staged or was this the, the property on This house was staged, yeah. Yeah. I bet it makes a pretty big difference how to get, get the house staged. It, you know, Realtor, National Association of Realtors stats show it can make a 17% difference in sale price. I find it's not that large of a difference here in the South Bay, but it does make a significant difference. It reduces your market time and will increase the yield that you get. 
a lot of times buyers can't look past certain things. Uh, they may not be able to look past older furniture or a type of rug or flooring or not know how big a bed really is. Will my bed fit in here? So staging can help to frame the space, but also make it feel more modern. So it really, really helps. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's uh, I think it's a good investment. When people do that. What is it? What does that cost? How, how does how do how do people factor that in to to the deal? Well, you know, it really can vary on the size of the home and how many rooms you're staging. But um, well, you know, let's typically, a you know, typical house. a typical home, if you're looking at a, a three bedroom, two bath, about, you know, 1600 square foot home in Redondo Beach, maybe single story on a larger lot. Um, you're looking anywhere from three to five thousand, maybe fifty five hundred dollars. Um, but it can increase, as I mentioned, uh, the exposure and the attention. Uh, nobody really shops by looking in the newspaper anymore. Everyone's looking online. So virtual tours, Matterport tours, uh, video, all of these things that you can really make use of with social media, get people in the door. And the more people you bring to the door, the more exposure you have, the more offers you may get and the higher the price goes. Um, but with staging, um, yeah, I'd say it's about that much. Now, most agents will maybe know of a stager. They might recommend one to a client, and then the seller would normally pay for that separately. But with my clients, whenever they hire me, I pay for the staging. Oh, okay. So it's no cost to them. That's cool. So let's talk about the, the geographic market. So on this map here, we've got what looks like uh, the north side of El Segundo mm -hmm. all the way down to, to the end of Torrance. Um, what is, so let's talk about like the, the different areas, like where, where are the different, what are the different price points? El Segundo is not a cheap city to live in. No, no. And that's really what gave rise to Hawthorne's spike in, in appreciation rates. Um, a lot of people on the West side and the West side market thought, you know, the thing I used to hear all the time was I don't want to go South of the airport. And then as prices got so high on the west side where you couldn't even get into a starter home for 1.5, they said, okay, well, let's just south of the airport. And El Segundo is already in that same range. Absolutely. Uh, and then they looked over at kind of the Wiseburn area and Holly Glen and said, well, this is, you know, right by uh, Manhattan Beach. It's close to the west side, the airport. And those areas went through the roof. Yeah. Because they were half that much. Well, I mean, truthfully, you know, not not to sound too critical, but if if the rest of the Hawthorne schools got mm -hmm. good, right, it it would be Hawthorne would be the next El Segundo. Absolutely. You know, it's it's really based on the schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're able to get into a school, you don't have to send your kids to private school. Like if you lived in West LA, for the most part, after after middle school, maybe even after some of the depending on which elementary school you go to. You, you may have to go private school because, uh, you know, the schools are just not that good. Right. It, it, they're at, you know, a good school district would be rated 6 out of 10. Like Culver City is known for their school systems, and they're basically averaging about 6 out of 10. Yeah. Um, in a sliver of, of Hawthorne, which some of it's county, some of it's Hawthorne, uh, when you have the Weisburn School District, that's kind of the exception. So what what is the what is the delta in price between a Weisburn school, a Weisburn location house, Versus the outside, do you think it's uh, if you went to other areas of Hawthorne? Yeah, it's a th solid three hundred thousand dollar difference. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Just for the school district alone, that's amazing. Right. All right, so let's go a little bit further south. Um, well, you got so you got Lawndale uh, mm -hmm. boarding Redondo Beach, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's I think that's the same scenario. If Lawndale got its school district squared away, they have a lot of money. Uh, Hermosa for a long time was looking at different. Um, options to fund their school district because they're so small only mm -hmm. mile by a mile and a half and they had thought about partnering with Lawndale and if you drive by Lawndale rebuilt their entire high school and all of their buildings they're all new construction so what do you think the impact has been to real estate in Lawndale as a result Lawndale's kind of uh, benefiting not so much from the school districts but just proximity to other areas kind of uh, dropping a pebble in a pond so to speak so radiating out from those higher price uh, areas such as the beach cities um, and RPV and PV um, you know proximity after that but it's reaching now so far that not only is Lawndale going up but even Carson which is a little further away where the schools aren't really uh, known they're not known for their good school district They've seen, you know, over a hundred percent increase in prices just in the last three or four years. That's amazing. Yeah, really. 
Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about Torrance. We're in mm-hmm. Torrance. I've had mm-hmm. my office here for six, seven years now. Okay. I've lived in Redondo for 11, 12. Mm-hmm. You know? And um, I love Redondo. I love living in Redondo. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like Torrance, too. Mm-hmm. I, if I didn't live in Redondo, I could totally live in Torrance. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Torrance, Torrence, um, city council's got their head right. It's pretty, pretty well run city for the mm-hmm. most part. Mm hmm. So, uh, so these are, these are the three main common style houses in the South Bay, right? You got, uh, what kind of walk us through these? Well, two on a lot, you'll see those, uh, throughout the South Bay, as we mentioned, but mainly, uh, or in the heaviest concentration will be Redondo beach. There are a lot of those 7,500 square foot lots that are 50 by 150 that they upzoned uh, to R3. Um, tall and skinny. These are really dominant throughout the South Bay. Um, they have since put a moratorium on lot splitting, but while it was allowed, most of the lots in the area were split. And so you have a lot of these tall and skinnies. Um, and then you have the modern coastal, which is... More of the Manhattan Beach or South Redondo um, desirable home right now where the lot is still larger. It allows you a lot of different architectural uh, flexibility in terms of where you put your garage and how you have different rooms laid out. You're not kind of confined into a narrow frontage. Yeah, yeah the tall and skinnies of uh, built in the 70s, they're just... There are ones that are... New, brand new construction. I oh, mean, they're oh tearing no, them sure. down yeah, and, no, no. and, and, and rebuilding them. And they should. You know, yeah. I, I think most people don't realize that the older tall and skinnies, from a structural mm-hmm. um, perspective, they're not very well built. No, the, they, were, they were thrown up. Yeah. Um, the, the, every time we, we, we do a major remodel, we always replace the subfloor on the second floor because it's mm-hmm. so spongy. You know, you walk right. on it, so you can't put... Anybody that wants to put tile in the bathroom, so you, you can't. It's, mm-hmm. too, it's too flexible, so you have to make a, a, stiff, mm-hmm. a stiffer floor. So those are all, uh, those types of houses are very common in our, in our area. So what, you know, let's talk a little bit about the, the South Bay lifestyle and mm-hmm. why people, why people are choosing to move here from, from LA, from mm-hmm. Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. What's the, what's the story? Well, I mean, you have the beach city lifestyle. So you have the, the sand, the surf, surfing, you know, bike riding, all of that good stuff. But the main difference would be the schools are much you have a much higher rating than you would find on the west side, but also it's just not as dense. When you go up on the west side, you it's know, it's gridlock. It's gridlock. You can't get anywhere. Parking becomes very difficult, especially that section of Lincoln between Washington and Venice. It's, you know, it'll take you a half hour just to go a it's few brutal. blocks. It's brutal. Um, but Santa Monica, you have, you know, a lot of higher buildings that have been put in in terms of uh, more stories and just higher population density. So you come down to the South Bay, it has a little bit more of a spread out, laid back, relaxed feel, more of a family area. Um, with all of the coastal activities that you have and the great schools. You know, one of the things that, you know, my, my daughter was raised, she went to Redondo schools her pretty much her whole life. She just graduated high school this, mm-hmm. this year. And there, there aren't that many places left in, in, um, I, I don't know. I don't know that I would do this anymore in, in LA. You know, I, I grew up in LA, but you know, my, my kids would, you, they would go. They could, they could go and ride their bikes mm-hmm. and go take the take the bus or take their bike the e bike over to their friend's house. You know, right. the other side of town. Right. And you never really worried about anything happening to them. You know, mm-hmm. LA's got a very significant uh, vagrancy problem. They do. That um, has gotten really out of hand. Yeah, I would agree. Do you see people coming in from like Santa Monica? I mean, Santa Monica's had a vagrancy problem for twenty five years, but. Do you see people moving in from L.A. and Santa Monica? Um, you know, there, there has been a smaller issue here in the South Bay for some time with vagrancy and some homelessness. Um, it hasn't really increased. Uh, they haven't relocated here, being chased out uh, from Venice. They kind of went back after they chased them out. Um, but the South Bay does have its own smaller version of the same problem that you're trying to deal with but it's not to the same extent and i would agree with you that you know your kids can still ride their bikes around the neighborhood my son rides his bike to school uh he's 14 Um, i have no problem or concern there uh so i i would definitely agree it's it's a different lifestyle yeah 
No, I, the density has a lot to do with it. And, you know, I got to give props to to uh, Mayor uh, Brandon and Redondo. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've really been fighting back against creating, you know, a a Santa Monica Pier situation down mm -hmm. over over there. And that's a that's a pretty controversial thing in itself, the power plan and the and the right. pier. But you know, if we're at eleven thousand uh, people here in, in Redondo, mm -hmm. what, what happens to the vibe if you put in four thousand more? And they've been battling with the state because the state's requiring more housing to go in. So Redondo Beach has been going back and forth with California as to how many new homes they'll have to put up. I think what's going to happen is. You're not going to see skyscrapers or five or even ten story buildings start going in. I think they're the next step will be they'll start to allow more ADUs and things that you're seeing in LA, it'll allow more garage conversions, things like that to try to get mother in law so called units in to kinda of ease that burden a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it's it's a trip. The the first ADUs that were built in Redondo, I think the people had to file a lawsuit because they didn't right. want to approve them. Right, and now in L.A., they want you to do it. They go out of their way. Yeah. To, yeah please convert your garage, please. It's it's kind of funny that... It's coming this way, though. I, I, I don't think you'll see an upzoning where all of a sudden you'll have an apartment building where there was a house before, but um, you might start to see ADUs and things like that. I, th I think you're right. I think it... There's... My block where I live, the lots are a little bit bigger, and I could totally see um, that being buildable there. Because mm -hmm. it, it isn't always buildable anywhere. Right. You know? Um, I, I remember we were talking uh, a few years ago, I think when the ADEU stuff first came out, and the way that I see it, if, if you know, and I probably shouldn't say this because it'll probably launch a, a bunch of people <laughs> doing this, but but the tall and skinnies are actually a very a very good um, candidate for doing this. They have a split, great setup for that. Because of the way the, the shotgun set up, mm -hmm. where the first and the second floor are set up, if you were to convert the garage, Mm -hmm. You could basically have two 800, 900 square foot units. Yeah, it's really easy with the typical tall and skinny layout to kind of enclose that staircase. Right. And, and to the front door and then just put a second door in there where there's a little foyer and then Done. convert the garage and, you you know, you have a two, two unit property. Yeah. And and the setup with the setups are normally there's already a bathroom mm -hmm. on each floor. Right. So you just have to when you convert the garage, you put the kitchen in there and, mm -hmm. and a, in a dining area and you're. You're done. You got the yeah. two bedrooms and, and the bathroom. You're already running gas up the wall to, to get to the second story because they have their reverse floor plan. So, you know, I, I don't know if that'll imp improve or increase the price of of the of the unit, but I, as far as the conversions or mm -hmm. adding ADUs, that seems to be the first the area where the low hanging fruit is to me. Right. Right. I think they'll go there first in an attempt to appease the state to supply more housing before they switch to larger buildings and if you do switch to larger buildings you'll see you know kind of the more commercial spaces where you'll have a larger uh you know restaurant or something like that that has a bigger lot and they'll say okay we'll change the zoning on this and allow a variance to put an apartment building in um but i don't think that would be the initial step i think that'll only be after the adu uh step comes in if that's not sufficient i agree i agree all right, so let's talk about uh, 2022. So what? Mm -hmm. let's talk about what's happened down here in the South Bay and, sure. and uh, give us uh, give us your perspective on... Um, on well, we had a really big surge uh, coming into March because everybody, you know, at the time, rates interest rates were still about 3.5%, give or take, depending on the type of loan you're getting and how much you're putting down. And everyone was concerned about the impending rate increases due to inflation. And so... Uh, a lot of the buyers at that time were people who had just sold. So they were under a lot of pressure to find that house and secure it. And there were 20, 30 offers per listing. That's amazing. Selling in three, four days, five days, only if you were waiting to do counter offers. And, um, you know, at that point, they had to start putting more money down, not asking for repairs, offering rent backs for free to the seller for a month, two months. Um, and we had a real spike and that spike lasted from, I would say March through about end of April into May. And then, uh, it started to cool off right away with the three, you know, the overnight lending rate, the federal reserve rate that most people see on TV doesn't directly affect the 30 year mortgage, but right. it affects the economy, which then affects the 30 year mortgage. And so as that started to increase, 
uh, it cooled off pretty quickly. So May into June, we saw a real dip. And it was about a 7.5% to 10% dip in just four to six weeks. So are we talking a dip in price or in volume? Dip in price. Volume stayed pretty steady. Um, people stopped dramatically overpaying. Not overpaying, but paying above, asking. Bidding up. Bidding, bidding up. up and, and, you know, um, as you went from 20 offers down to two or three, now the buyer is able to get uh, price closer, uh, closer to list price or real market value and to start asking for some repair uh, to be done to the house. But since that drop off, we've now seen it kind of bubbling back up. And so from July to August, average you know, median price in the South Bay Beach City area has kind of ticked up a little bit. Um, so, so right now, as we're at 1.3, we were at in 2021, mm -hmm. we're at 1.24 average. Right. And that's over the course of the year. But the first, as I mentioned, seven months of this year, we're really that that graph shows a, a steady climb from January through March into April and May, and then a serious dip and then a little bit of an increase coming in August. So um, it depends on how, you know, gas prices are coming down. If this then affects goods that are shipped and trucked, et cetera, et cetera. If inflation starts to come down and you don't see too many more interest rate increases. Um, the market could actually hold where it starts to go back to normal, where it would go up 3%, 4% a year, rather than 7, 10, 15%, depending on the area. Um, however, if those interest rate increases do continue and inflation does not come down, I think you'll see it cool even more. So what do you, what do you make of the people, you know, there's all, I guess in every market, there's always a uh, naysayers predicting doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think about that going 12 months out? I don't think you'll see doom and gloom because when you look back at what happened in 2007, um, in 03, 04, 05, all of the, the buyers were doing the three-year fixed mortgages and five-year fixed mortgages because they had the better pricing. At that sure. point, they were 5.5%, and everyone thought that was fantastic. That's right. And um, they figured, well, I'm not going to be here long. I'm flipping houses and fixing and, and getting money out. Um, and so when Alan Greenspan, who was the Fed chair at that time, started raising the overnight lending rate, that does affect adjustable rate mortgages. And so he raised it 13 times in a row. All of those mortgages adjusted, and then everybody had to sell because they couldn't afford that mortgage anymore. Yeah. But all the folks who've been buying the last 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, they're using 30-year fixed. So if you locked in at 3% or 3.5% and the rate goes to 10%, it still doesn't affect you. It's not going to make you need to sell your home. And so inventory has stayed low. It's actually a little lower than it was last year statistically in terms of number of new listings coming on the market. So that's, that's actually, we're going to be talking about next is the, is the number of days on the market. Mm -hmm. So 20, the, the, the data that you gave us for 2021, mm -hmm. you show 22 days, average days on the market before it sells. Mm -hmm. Now 2022 year to date, we're talking 16 days. Right. And that's the average across all properties. So that's taking into account some properties that may have uh, legal issues or probate issues that stay on the market for 300 days because they're going through and they're averaged in. Uh, what you're seeing is last year, um, normally you'd have offers after the first week to two weeks worth of uh, showings and open houses. And as we got into March through April, it would get through one weekend and then the offers would come in and they'd spend four or five days uh, doing multiple counter offers before putting it into escrow, usually on Thursday or Friday of that next week. So you'd see days on market of eight, nine, 10, but they had 15, 20 offers in by day three. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, that, that is a little bit, um, there's definitely a little bit more detail in that, in that data point. All right, so let's talk about quantity. Mm -hmm. So the uh, available, so so right here, twenty twenty one, three hundred houses. Walk us through that. Yeah, database. this is based on the monthly average because um, we're doing year to date as compared to twenty twenty one. So if you look at the monthly average of new listings coming on the market, in twenty twenty one we had about an average of three hundred, and, and year to date this year it's two eighty four. Um, and this is for the beach city communities, El Segundo, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa, Redondo, and Torrance. Um, so actually inventory has dropped slightly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because the folks who have decided to sell have sold. With the market cooling a little, people now are, you're getting into the people who need to sell, whether they're relocating for work or 
uh, some other reason. It's not the speculative sellers. Okay, cool. Um, surrounding city stats. All right, cool. Yeah, I think it's good to talk also about the surrounding cities, and I mm-hmm. appreciate you brought in some data for that. So walk us through this chart. Yeah, you know, surrounding cities have Hawthorne, Lawndale, Gardena, Lomita, Carson. Um, the numbers are fairly similar in that you do see a nice increase in value on, in terms of median sales price from 2021 to year to date. Uh, where this differs a little bit, though, is the days on market haven't really changed much. They're selling about as fast as they did last year. And uh, that bordering community didn't really have that bump in March through May. They stayed pretty consistent all throughout the year. And I think that that uh, data point goes to what we were speaking about earlier, where a lot of folks were selling and then uplegging. And so those folks that had sold and were now in escrow or in their rent back period and had to buy really fueled that bump in prices, uh, um, you know, between March and May. But in the bordering communities, you, you had kind of a steady. So are we, are, are we talking about 161 days on the market? No, this is, um, it was 17 days on market, uh, last, uh, in 2021 average time to sell on year to date, it's 18. So it's roughly the same. The 161 is the average monthly, uh, inventory account. Yeah. Gotcha. Number of new listings. And this year we're looking at about 155. So it's a slight decrease. Hmm. Um, but roughly, you know, you have an increase in price, roughly about the same amount of time to sell, uh, but a little less actually out there. So that goes to show you in terms of sellers who might be thinking about selling now, um, you still have an opportunity where the market is still strong. Um, you're not going to be flooded with offers. You may actually have to fix a few things. Um, you may not get all of the terms and conditions that you would have uh, received three or four months ago, but uh, the market is still going pretty strong. What do you think um, of of these surrounding cities? Which one do you think is is really the nicest like the more desirable i would say hawthorne by far really uh took off and uh separated itself you know part of hawthorne you have the Wiseburn school district which is highly rated but the rest of hawthorne you have a lot of uh, influx of engineer jobs uh, a lot of aerospace spacex coming in and expanding um so a lot of white collar uh, jobs moving into the city of Hawthorne. And then also you have a lot of West side buyers who've kind of previously said they wouldn't really go South of the airport and, uh, almost like it was the end of the earth. And, yeah. uh, then they yeah, okay, well, you know, West side prices are so high. What's just South of the airport. And El Segundo has always been a relatively high priced community. And they look well, just a few blocks away at, uh, what would be called Del Air, um, which is in the Wiseburn school district and homes were, half the price less than half the price for the same size house same size house same size really lot. nice neighborhoods sure, too sure you know nice backyards yeah. um and so they got gobbled up and prices went through the roof holly Glen being the hottest area in hawthorne because it borders right near manhattan beach and those homes went from five six seven hundred thousand to now 1.4 1.5 that's amazing yeah that's amazing All right, so give us a profile of of your of the typical South Bay market um, buyer. Well, typically, it's going to be a, usually a young family. They'll have some kids um, in school age, uh, typically middle age. You know, anywhere from late youth, if you want to call thirties, yeah, late youth uh, up through middle age, but. Um, most of the, you know, you're always going to have in LA relocation people coming from other states. Um, but a lot, I would say in the last 12 months, a lot of it has been up like buyers, people who are moving around. And I think that was a COVID effect. Um, when COVID hit uh, and everyone had to spend time in the house, rather than everyone going their own way and then meeting up for dinner and spending two or three hours together, everybody spent the entire day together. And it went to school and went to work from home and everybody kind of realized I need more space. Yeah. And so uh, that was a big, big factor and people relocating. So you have a larger percentage of the buyers now um, made up of those folks. I, I um, in, in our business, we, we hear, we have, we're doing a few additions and everybody wants some home office space, mm-hmm. right? 
um, double pane windows, maybe right. some, some more insulation in the wall. So you hear the gardener mm-hmm. you know, doing their thing outside that, and you know, it's, it's part of the COVID phenomenon, right? Right. It's, it, it really has changed things. Um, I, you know, I think after a certain amount of time, maybe things will go back to normal, but in the foreseeable future, I see a lot of people, once you work from home mm-hmm. and you, and the employers see that they don't need to add office space. Right. And the productivity didn't go down. Right. You're like, well, you know, let's let's kind of keep this going. That's the big factor. I think a lot of companies were concerned about having people work from home because they thought they'd be surfing the internet or on Facebook or something like that rather than working. And when the companies had no choice but That's to right. have everyone at home, they're like, wow, well, actually productivity stayed the same. Or actually, I've read some articles where it went up. Mm-hmm. And so they said, we don't really need all of this brick and mortar. And so I think while some people will trans- transition back into an office environment, it may be part-time as opposed to full-time, where they work part of the time at home for the same company and part of the time in the office. So I think that home office necessity is going to stay. I agree. I think so. I, I think particularly if you have a long commute or, or maybe not a long commute, but a hellacious commute, if mm-hmm. you commute through West, West LA mm-hmm. um, or you go from the Valley into LA, right? Mm-hmm. All, any of those are hellacious commutes, Santa Clarita mm-hmm. and into LA. Um, all of a sudden you're talking, well, I'll do that two days a week. That's yeah. a lot more tolerable than five days a week. I've had a lot of buyer clients recently who have said, well, I, I work over here, but I can travel further out for a house because I'm only going to go into the office once a week or twice a week. And the rest of the time I'll work from home remotely. So I, it definitely is a phenomenon that I think will stay because there's a business as a financial incentive for the companies to keep it that way. I agree. And so, um, you know, that has led to a real separation between four bedroom properties and three bedroom properties and price range. The typical appraiser will only make an adjustment of about 12,500 bucks for a bedroom if they don't have a direct comp. But when you look at, the actual difference in value for bedrooms are far more valuable. I've seen a, a lot of, uh, I've seen quite a few pop-up companies. I think it started with the ADU phenomenon here mm-hmm. in California, but where they'll deliver a prefabbed uh, little, op- I mean, for lack of a better word, it's a, sh- it's a pretty shed. Yeah. But they'll crane it in the backyard and right. y- all you need is somebody uh, to put in the foundation and run some electrical to it. And, mm-hmm. you know, you are you went from nothing to a secondary, you know, auxiliary office. Right. In, in no time at, at a relatively affordable price. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, it, and if you, the, the, they have the prefab ones that like you just mentioned, or they would convert their garage or a, a portion of the garage. If they had a two car I've seen or a three car where they would take one or two of the stalls and completely convert them to an office and put kind of a, a AC in there and yep. make it a little more comfortable, but work from home. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep. That's definitely a COVID phenomenon. It definitely is. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. So, Greg, what do you think your what do you think your outlook is for twenty twenty three? You know, right now, I think you'll see still a steady climb in price, maybe in that three to five percent range as we go through the rest of twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty three could we could see a decline now typically up cycles and you know up markets are always found, followed by a down market and the market's cyclical so there'll always be uh, a couple of down years where prices then decline a little bit and then they go back up and they go higher than they were before so you're never going to buy a house for the same price you could in 1980 or 1990 um, but there may be a year or two where your value drops a little and that was more pronounced in 2007 through 2010 um, but typically up cycles last five to six years and a down cycle lasts about two, maybe three. Um, we've now gone through what would be two up cycles back to back from 2010 all the way through 2022. Um, so I think even if the interest rates didn't go up and the inflation problem wasn't a factor, you would start to see a cooling of the market um, where you might have a moderate or slow, you know, slight down cycle, not a crash like we saw, but a slight down cycle. Uh, but now with increasing interest rates, I, I think that you will see it. I think that the real estate market will get hit. And I think 2023, you will see a decline in value. But that's normal. And that's par for the course. So as we get into 2023, maybe 2024, you might have two years where prices decline some, and then they'll go back up. And as you get into the next up cycle, they'll go even higher than they are now. 
What um what role do you think the Fed has in in that dynamic that you just described? Well, I mean, right now they're trying to pull a lot of money out of the economy um, to stem inflation. Uh, if they continue doing three quarter, you know, three you know, seventy five basis point increases. Uh, credit cards, all the adjustable rate loans will get more expensive, and then everyone's monthly bills will be more expensive, in addition to the 30-year rate going up over time. Um, so it'll continue to cool demand. It already has to some extent. And um, so with the cooling of demand, you'll see some decline in pricing. But when it crashed, there was another factor. There was a massive spike in inventory in 2007. And uh, as we talked about, you don't have that three-year, five-year fixed mortgage crowd that was a majority of the crowd. Um, I think it was about 37% in 2007, and now it's less than six. So um, there were over six times the number of folks with those short-term fixed mortgages. And that really fueled the spike in uh, inventory when the market crashed in 07. But you don't have those conditions now. So even with the high inflation and even with the increasing interest rates, there aren't a lot of folks selling. And so as long as that holds true, you'll see a slight decline, but it won't be a crash. So so there there won't be an artificial cause to sell like, like we saw where people mm-hmm. couldn't afford to make the payment. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I think about the the catalyst, right, for for the price increase and it's is really low interest rates. Mm-hmm. If you if we would have had, it would be my it's my opinion. If we would have had interest rates at six percent, seven percent, like they were right up to in, t- in two thousand four, leading mm-hmm. up to the crash, um, you could argue that 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 the price appreciation wouldn't have been there as 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 robust as it was. Well, I think it was a, a series of um, external economic factors that led to policy from different administrations um, continuing the low cost of money. Um, when you look at interest rates that, like I mentioned a little earlier, rates were 55 to 6% back in 2003, 4, 5. They weren't as 35 well, that, that, so that's and, my point. And, and, but, but at that point, prices were going up very rapidly. Appreciation was going through the roof, which is why people kept buying with the three-year fix. They figured, I'm going to buy it. It's going to go up 100 grand, 200 grand. I'm going to sell it and move on to the next one. And then the music stopped. 100%. And they were caught with those three-year fixed mortgages. Um, so the three and a half, you know, you have all of the stimulus with COVID. You have before that... Uh, stimulus from changing administrations, wanting to keep the economy going. Um, And at that point, there wasn't any inflationary scare. Um, So I think that there are some external factors. There could always be something that comes up, whether it be some sort of a war or terrorist attack or something else that leads to them lowering it. But um, Well, I I was just thinking if the Fed is is forced to continue to raise rates mm -hmm. to the point where the money markets, it, it actually hits the money markets in a significant way mm-hmm. where the 30 year goes up to 6%, six and a half, seven percent You would, you would have to, I, I mean, I would think that the same force that pri- that raised the values up mm-hmm. would be the same force that would bring the values down. It could drop um, at a more intense rate, but it would depend on how many increases. So yeah. that, that really follows, okay, so how does this unfold? Because the inflationary rate that we're seeing now is kind of artificial. It's due to, you know, COVID, everybody went inside. Then everybody got a lot of money. And helicopter money, out. yeah. We've never done that before. Right, and then they got let out of their homes and they said, hey, I want to go on vacation, I want to go buy things. And right. so as that cools, um, you know, once again, gas is starting to come down. We'll have to see how it plays out. If you have two or three more increases, you may – once again, slip into a down market, but it won't necessarily be a crash. Now, if inflation is not coming down and they're continuing interest rate increases of this size all the way into next year to next summer, then yeah, it will have a dramatic effect. Right. I don't, I agree with you. I don't think we're going to have a crash. I think I, for me, energy prices, well, not for me, but I mean, most people would consider energy prices as kind of a leading indicator, right? Mm-hmm. When you're ramping up and there's demand and things are being shipped and there's demand for production, 
energy is one of the main inputs into mm-hmm. into any 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 production, right? Right. If I want to go give quotes or deliver lumber to, to somewhere, I got to consume mm-hmm. petrol, right? I got to consume diesel and gas. So so I, I think that as as the as the prices of fuel and energy come down, um, that I mean, I think that's in the right direction. Mm-hmm. You know, when 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 I saw diesel at seven dollars, I was like, and if this hits ten, we're gonna be we're gonna have some real problems. I thought so as well. I think there was a. It's a, on a side note. I thought there was a lot of price gouging that went into that. I mean, I was driving around. I would see two gas stations on opposite corners of the same street, and one was a dollar less per gallon than the other one. Um, so you have individual owners who kind of and companies, you know, Chevron, Mobile, some of the larger names will have higher gas prices than say Arco or something like that. Um, but there was a little bit of that going on, but as it comes down across the board, I agree with you. I think it should definitely have an impact on shipping costs and moving of goods across the country by truck, um, and other things, which hopefully has an impact on inflation, but it's just a matter of how much. And if it's not enough of an impact, they will continue increasing the overnight lending rate to take money out of circulation and, you would have to think that it may go to the point where, okay, now that we've gone a little too far where inflation's really dropping, and but the economy's starting to stall a little, and then they'll ease up. Um, but I would think that they'll go more in that direction because we're over 9% at this point. That's crazy. It's crazy that you have a 9% inflation rate and you can get a mortgage for three and a little bit under four still now, right? Or maybe four and a quarter now. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, you know, you got to, look, if you're, if you have basic arithmetic, right, from mm-hmm. like elementary school, you, you would see that that, if, if, if the Fed wasn't manipulating the interest rate, that would be impossible. Mm-hmm. No bank would lend the money at half the cost of inflation. Right. That, that it, just, that the, it's impossible. It's they devaluing when you, when you take out the interest, which you get a tax break for, you're actually not really paying interest because the dollar is devaluing faster. Than, That's right. Than I mean, interest. if you were to, if they didn't have, they, everybody always hears, well, who's they? If the Fed wasn't manipulating the, the price mm-hmm. of the cost of, of borrowing, the real interest rate would have to be 13%, 14%, something like that. Well, it was in the 80s, and, and you look at how much lower home prices were then. And um, I don't think we'll get that high on the 30-year fixed. Um, there are more and more folks now starting to look at other mortgages as the rate goes up. They're looking for alternatives. So some folks are starting to look at the 10-year fixed or 7-year fixed. Um, but... I, I, I agree. I think that the 30 year will continue to creep up. You can easily see six to 7% by the end of the year. There's some people saying maybe as high as nine to 10. Um, it's a bit of an unknown um, at this point, but I think as long as it kind of keeps with the pace that we're looking at, and then if inflation does start to come down as the fuel indicator is, is showing it might, um, I don't think you'll see a crash. I think you'll see a down market, but down markets happen. If you look at, you know, over the last 40 years, you'll have, it kind of goes up and then down slightly and then up and down slightly. And, and it could even be flat. I mean, you could consider in, in, in a, in a market that's overheated for it to stabilize. Mm-hmm. It could be a good thing. That happens. It, that, that does happen quite a bit, but that's more of a national thing. You'll see that in more rural areas. Um, if you get outside of the beach city or South Bay area and you get the Inland empire or Riverside, you could see, where it just flattens and prices stay the same. Yeah. Yeah, possible. Well, we'll see how it goes. I think uh, the next six months are going to be pretty interesting to, to they watch. They definitely will. They definitely will. But, you know, it's still it's still a healthy time to sell, and rates are – you can still get a decent rate. So it's kind of a good time to sell and to buy right now, but that could change. Well, you know, timing the market, whether you're buying stocks or real mm-hmm. estate, is it's just – you know, when you when you sell at a good time, mm-hmm. you could take the credit and look like a genius. But right. but no one ever no one ever takes credit when they you know when they sell in the down market and they lose money, right? Right. That's not as public as when you know when when they do well. Well, I think with homes, it's it goes a little further than just the average investment. So I bought my home in two thousand six, and it was at the height of the market at that point, and then the crash happened. But now my home is worth far more than it was then. Um, 
If you buy the house in the area that you want to, if you have kids and you want to raise your family, you are in the right school district or you're where you, you know, near work or uh, just where you want to plant roots, um, you can always refinance your loan down the line when the rates change. You're really investing in the community. And so it's a large investment. It's something that makes you money. And a lot of folks will just kind of chase, oh, hey, I like the closet space or the nice kitchen island. Uh, There is an investment factor, but you are going to live there. So there's a little bit of subjectivity there too. Well, you know, as, as you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 47 now. Mm-hmm. And, um, as you start looking at, you know, what's the next 25 years, 30 years of my life going to look like to a certain degree, you're trying to buy price stability mm-hmm. for yourself, right? Cause if you, if you live in a non rent control area, your, your cost of living as a renter is going to keep going up. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and if your if your financial income is not um, beating or exceeding that, mm-hmm. then you're, you eventually you'll you'll have a kind of an inverse, right? In mm-hmm. in, 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 the, in the two in the in that relationship. So so to a, a certain extent, you're you're trying to um, obviously you want to buy a house you can afford, but you're you're trying to get to a point where your monthly expenditure gets becomes fixed to a certain degree when you mm-hmm. get a 30 year mortgage. Right. I mean, that's, that's how I view it. What do you think about that? No, I agree. Um, I, you know, at the time that using myself as an example, at the time that I bought my house, the mortgage payment was higher than what I would have paid to rent the same house, but I locked in at a 30 year fixed and now my rent is almost 60%. I mean, my mortgage is 60% of what I would pay to rent it. Right. And that's, as you mentioned, it's rent will only continue going up, which is where buying investment property is such a good deal because if you can lock in and your costs are fixed or close to fixed uh, and you know rent's going to continue to go up, yeah. you, you have a better rate of return. I, I have a lot of friends that tell me now, like, hey, man, I couldn't afford to live in this neighborhood now. I'm glad I bought right. They bought maybe 10, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I couldn't afford to live here now. They bought right. a few of my, my pals, they bought in at like, say, Three hundred fifty thousand, four hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and their place is worth a little bit over a million dollars. And they're not going to sell. And they're not going to sell. So that's where it gets back to the lower inventory, where I just don't see a crash coming because it's not. It would have to be the the decrease in demand, which is real because of the interest rates, would have to be coupled with a serious spike in inventory. There would have to be something to cause those folks, like your friend, to have to sell. And if they sell, where are they going to go? They couldn't afford to live in the community that they love and live in now. So those folks will tend to just hunker down and stay. Yeah, I agree. All right, guys, uh, we're going to get into our next segment here. We're going to cover uh, Greg's tips for buyers and sellers. All right, Greg, run through your tips. Uh, Number one, uh, definitely consult an agent. Uh, You want to get not just uh, a proper understanding of how to market the property or what needs to be done, um, but pricing. Pricing is so, so crucial. There is an effect of when a property sits on a market more than about three or four weeks. Buyers will look at it and go, what's what's wrong with this one? Why hasn't this one sold? Everyone else must know something I don't know. (laughs) And um, you have the most activity on any new home in the first three, new listing in the first three weeks. So you want to price the property where it will have, it falls in the the value range. Uh, No home has a set exact dollar value. There's a a range that it should sell in. And you want to come in that range and it, preferably in the lower part of that range, you get more attention, you sell quicker, and you have a few offers, and you hopefully bid the price up. Um, but overpricing the home will kill you because basically then what you're doing is you're making all of the other homes look like the, the good buy, and you're sending the buyers over there. Even though they may love your house, they go, well, that one's $100,000 less, and the kitchen's not as nice, but I can live with it. And you're basically sending the buyers to someone else's listing. And then as you sit, you now become the property that there must be something wrong with. Why hasn't this one sold? And so pricing is really, really important. Um, Number two, as the market starts to cool down, it's a good idea to get a home inspection. Um, A lot of folks don't crawl into their house and check their plumbing or drain lines or shower pans things like that on a regular basis. They just assume everything's working, but then they get into escrow and they find, 
wow, I have a leaky shower pan. My water heater is about to go. And the buyer brings in their person who throws out a super high number. Right. And now you are negotiating based on those numbers. Whereas if you get that inspection in advance, at the very least, you can get your own estimates, which will be, you know, accurate. Um, and more so you can fix some of those things and make the home uh, more appealing to a buyer. 30 to 35% of escrows will fall through and they fall through in that inspection phase. Now, mm -hmm. it's not always because of what the buyer finds. They may just change their mind or get cold feet, but uh, often they'll see an inspection report and they'll go, oh my God, there's so many things wrong here. We're buying a money pit. <laughs> and so if, if you can knock out some of the smaller ones and you have your contractor come in and, and they just clean up a bunch of that stuff, it really can save you a lot of money. I agree. I, I get called uh, maybe three times a month with uh, new buyers. Mm -hmm. They got an inspection report and, and they have no idea what it costs. Right. Um, you know, they get a big long list. And, you know, the inspection guys are pretty thorough mm -hmm. and they give you a list of everything they see. That's their job. Mm -hmm. And there's there's different degrees of, of right. urgency and mm -hmm. you know, things that have to be repaired. But, but you're right. If you get an, inspe uh, an inspection report that's 30 pages, Right. It's like, it's so overwhelming. Like after page seven, you're like, man, I don't know about this house. People have that effect just with borrowing the money. You know, they may be putting down a nice sizable down payment, but when it, when their offer gets signed, it, it becomes real. Like, oh my God, we're about to borrow all of this money and we're going to have this payment. And they have that nervousness, especially if they're first or second time home buyers. And then they get the inspection report. And they go, oh my God, this is this is really crazy. <laughs> and so uh, we have to back out. We're too afraid. And they don't realize that even home, brand new construction will have a laundry list. Some of the longest lists of items I've seen have been on brand new construction homes because no one's lived in them yet. So they don't know that, hey, that thing's not working over there or this valve is still closed. So uh, getting a home inspection can really, really help. And then lastly, staging. And this is where having a good agent comes in is they can bring in a partner that they work with who does staging Prepping your property for sale and making it show ready is so crucial. Uh, there's a National Association of Realtors statistic which shows that staged homes will sell for 17% more than non-staged homes. And that's across the country. You're taking different markets into account. But I can tell you from 20 years of experience that it is a real, real effect. And the reason for that is a lot of sellers become so attached to their homes that they well. You know, that fence, I built that fence myself, and that makes my house worth $50,000 more. And I like the way I decorate my home. I would never put that piece of artwork there. And I, what's right. wrong with my mustard yellow carpet? Right. Um, so they, get a, they take offense. But when you're selling your home, you're converting it. You're converting it from your personal space and home and what works for you, and you're turning it into a product. Mm -hmm. And when you turn it into a product, it has to appeal to as many people as possible. You want to make it look like that generic model home that anybody could be living in. So you take down all your sports teams and any religious things, anything that might exclude, you know, you may have a, a Dodger guy who says, Hey, that's a giant's house. I'm not <laughs> buying that house. It's a giant's house. Um, <clears throat> what do you think about like, like painting the house? Like paint painting? goes a long way and it's cheap. Relatively paint, speaking, paint goes a long way. Just I a fresh coat of like Swiss coffee. A fresh coat on the inside will make it look clean and neat, which is a really big thing for a yep. lot of buyers. But a fresh coat on the outside, too, really increases curb appeal. And people drive by a property that their realtor sent them or that they saw online before they go to the open house for schedule of showing. And if right. they drive by and it looks nice driving by at 5 to 10 miles per hour, they go, well, yeah, let's go inside. And if they see peeling paint and it looks kind of like a fixer and they're the type that can't really swing a hammer – they're going to keep going and they're not going to come in. So paint is huge. I went to go see a house personally uh, for me in, in Torrance. And uh, man, I'm a contractor. Right? Mm -hmm. This house was hammered. Yeah. It was hammered. Yeah. And it's kind of like what I was looking for, you know, cause it's, it's going to be cheap, but, but it was just amazing um, how bad the curb appeal was. Right. The, the side, the driveway was all cracked. The, the walkway into the front of the house was cracked. Mm -hmm. The paint, it looked like it hadn't been painted in 25 years. The trees looked um, like, I think the realtor made them cut the trees back because it looked like it had just kind of grown into the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it just showed bad. 
And people tend to think in round numbers. So when a buyer walks in, if they look at something like, oh, that's going to be 10 grand or that's 50 grand, <laughs> yeah. and then they'll find some, uh, oh, there's a few doorknobs that are broken. That means it's 100 grand. <laughs> and they, they think in round numbers. So they, yeah. you know, they go up and up and up. Oh, this is going to need $300,000 worth of work. And they're right. not even talking to their contractor to find out what it right. really, but then they just walk out. And so if you only get one offer, one month in or two months in, they're going to want a lower price and they're going to want everything fixed. But if you don't scare those other folks off and you have three, four offers, I'm not even talking about the 20 offers that we just went through, but three or four or five offers, now they have to increase their price. Now they have to say, okay, I'll take on some of the repairs that I may find in the inspection report because I want it over those other folks. And it changes the whole leverage of the negotiation. And paint can really do that. It's really amazing. Yeah. And it's not expensive. And it's quick. Relatively speaking, yeah. You can transform something in a few days. You don't have to remodel your kitchen. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I'm working on a house right now in uh, in Redondo that they put, they're actually putting in a few hundred thousand dollars in the mm-hmm. house. It's going to be a multi-million dollar house. Right. But the they had a, it was a rental for the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. So it's got, it's a time capsule, right? It mm. was a time capsule. It looks pretty now. It looks pretty nice. We're almost right. done with it now. But I would imagine once we're done and, and they put it for sale, I think, I think uh, to your point, I think it's going to sell in, in a few uh, in, in a few days. Right, yeah. And, you know, um, it, it, if you can't, I mean, doing that really helps because you're bringing it. But uh, folks that have older furniture, I've walked into homes that I was showing to a buyer and I'm talking to the other agent he's like yeah they just wouldn't move anything out and i'm like you know if they got rid of the old furniture and threw a coat of paint up it wouldn't look like such an older home it would actually look relatively new yeah. um not brand new but that would go along and then you throw some staging in because now you have newer furniture and plants and f- and people's eyes are drawn to uh bright colors so that's why you'll see a lot of flowers in mm-hmm. staging because the white flower pops against the background and your art, your eye starts to dart around the picture and your brain says, there's something interesting here. We should, we should go look at this. It looks cute. Um, when you walk into a home, you have the same effect when you have it staged. And so their eyes are darting around. The furniture looks newer. The paint is nice and uh, neat and clean, freshly painted. And they go, wow, this place looks great. Um, a lot of times when the staging stuff is removed and the buyer will come in and it's Hey, what happened? So they'll say, well, you know, it looks a little older now because the furniture was newer. Sure. So staging can really, really help. And that's part of your, you know, your agent and your team that you hire when they come in. They can, they can, it can mean the difference of tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, it's really a, an interesting phenomenon how that, how that all, the whole thing works. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a good point folks. The next segment is Alex's trivia corner. All right. And every week, uh, that we bring you a show, we have our trivia question. Mm-hmm. So uh, since we're having a local realtor here, we have a local question. Okay. So the question is, this is for our viewers, uh, go ahead and, and post your, uh, your answer in the, uh, in the comment section. And we're going to send you a little, a little surprise from either Pete's coffee or Starbucks. So the, que- the trivia question for this week's uh, episode is, what famous martial artist grew up in the South Bay? A, Steven Seagal. B, Bruce Lee. C, Carlos Chuck Norris. D, David, what is that, Cardin? I can't read Carradine. it. Carradine. Carradine. Yeah. Is that, are you talking about the, the Kung Fu guy? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. All right, guys. So go ahead and post your uh, your answers below, and uh, Brian will make sure he sends you out the uh the, uh, the delicious uh, and very transportable gift card. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the questions that uh, co- are commonly uh, sent to us here. Mm-hmm. Let's drill down. Okay, we talked about the uh, house appreciation here in the South Bay. Mm-hmm. So let, let's talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the air. We, we kind of neglect the Torrance a little bit. I think we need to give Torrance a little bit of love. Okay. So let's talk about the, the Hollywood Riviera mm-hmm. uh, area. What Why do do people like living there versus kind of the, the other parts of Torrance? It's a great community. I mean, it's just, 
it's so walkable. You have the whole Highwood Riviera area with shops and restaurants. And while some of them are larger companies, a lot of them are mom and pop shops. And it gives it kind of that neighborhood, small towny almost feel yeah. where you know everyone, you park in the center and you just walk around. And on top of it, the beach is only a block away. That's right. And, um, you know, you have all of the best things of the South Bay combined with this really just great neighborhood you feel it's it's awesome it's really great i agree 100 percent. i love love going down there even south redondo that where those two meet where, mm-hmm. where when you get them. avenues yeah yeah absolutely so let's talk a little bit about the home stock uh in in our area our mm-hmm. our average uh build date now there's definitely a lot of new construction mm-hmm. uh, happening here but uh if we look at the at the macro stock uh year built Mm-hmm. Of the houses, what are we talking about? 1945 to 1955. Yeah. That would be 85 percent of the homes, probably. So pretty much post-war. Yeah, poor yeah. war houses. So um, okay, cool. So what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> that means you better do a home inspection <laughs> because um, even copper pipes and things like that only have a 40-year lifespan on average. So you're going to have some older systems, but it also means to expect that things are going to be wrong. Every house has issues, so you have to put them in, as you mentioned, some are more severe than others. You have to put them into categories, things that I have to do now, things that are kind of handyman-esque type work that I'm just cleaning up some smaller things, and then things that um, are more serious long-term issues like, hey, the roof's about to go. I have to get somebody in here to look at that, or uh, this house has galvanized plumbing. It doesn't... It, wasn't converted over to, to copper, which means I really have to kind of replace that soon. Or it has a 100 amp panel on a house that's over 1,500 square feet, and I want to put an AC, and I'm going to really need a new electric panel. Or maybe it has one of the old panels. I see a lot of Zinsco and Bulldog oh, yeah. panels that are <laughs> recalled, and you're like, wow, this house didn't burn down. So I guess it, yeah. it got, they got they lucky. got the lucky. They got the ones made on a Thursday. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> But what it means is you're going to see some issues, and that's okay. Just, you know, consult your professionals, find out what you're looking at, expect it walking in, and you can handle it. Yeah. So I I think um, probably over the last two years, we've seen the most, the the scenario where people bought a house, didn't move into it Mm -hmm. with the intention of remodeling it Mm -hmm. and, and um, hired somebody to to do a full gut rehab. So we've probably done four in the last two years that are gut gut rehabs. We did one, one smaller house in PV estates and uh, you know, PV estates is his own thing. It's a difficult place to do construction. Right. So it took, it took a a while to get the plans approved, but they put in six hundred thousand into that house. Mm-hmm. It's it basically it was a shell. Mm-hmm. We just we gutted the whole thing, new roof, uh, new insulation. We left most of the stucco. We did we did a lot of stucco repair around the windows, mm-hmm. but they, they put a lot of money in. They completely changed all the infrastructure, so new mm-hmm. sewer lines, new feeds, all that stuff. They sold that house probably six months later. Mm-hmm. They decided not to move to California. I wonder mm-hmm. why, but. They made, I think, I think they made like eight hundred grand. Yeah, you know, this is where your team really comes in as well. Uh, in your agent is because they can do what we call a CMA or comparative market analysis um, or comp report, and they can tell you, okay, hey, here's what other homes in this condition are selling for. But they then can also say, if you do X, Y, and Z, if you do a remodel like you just outlined, Alex. This is what it would be worth. And as long as there's a, an equity margin there, then you're making a good investment. And it's wise decision if you have the ability to do it, to go in there and do those things. The owner was so nervous because, you know, I think our original budget was 380 I think mm-hmm. I want to say. 380 400 tops. Mm-hmm. And we open up the walls and like like the AC unit, the AC system in this house had underground duct work. Mm. When you, I don't think he ever ran a camera down them, but they right. were all, they were collapsed in right. some of the areas. Like if you turn on the heater, it didn't have it didn't have AC. You turn on the heater of the AC, you'd have dust blow out the vent on the ground. Right, right. So, and luckily this this gentleman had the resources to do it, but, um, you know, it, it was just really amazing. And it vaulted ceilings had a, the, the had a crazy fireplace with the barbecue mm-hmm. brick thing. It was the fireplace divided two rooms. That's mm-hmm. how big it was. 
and we demoed that out and we re-engineered the the repair on the roof and mm -hmm. he kept the vaulted ceilings um but it had no insulation so mm. we put the insulation on the outside oh we used these um these uh, structural uh, insulation panels okay that go on from the outside so our, our engineer designed kind of a retrofit to the roof framing. Mm -hmm. We put the panel on top and then we put the tile on top of that. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is that for six inches of insulation, he got like 22 inches of insulation. That is what you would have in the attic. Yeah, color, right? in terms of... Uh, so all of a sudden that heat that would radiate in the summer from the ceiling mm -hmm. in the bedrooms was gone. There, there, wow. there was no more of that. So... You know, he, I, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I think he was very nervous mm -hmm. as, as the, the bills piled up. But I, uh, he, he was a finance guy, so I'm pretty sure he had a pretty good idea of what, mm -hmm. you know, of what his uh, potential could have been if, if he sold the rent. It was across the street from the golf course, mm -hmm. up there. So that, um, that was actually a pretty, uh, pretty good transaction for him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of these uh, hidden gems. In the condo market, in the real estate market, where do you see some of these hidden gems that people are can find value if they if they kind of scratch a little bit at the surface? Well, any fixer that's aesthetically dated, you can do some work to and increase the value. But where I think you can really make some money um, and quickly is where you can add you can take a home a basic three bedroom one bath, and if you can make it a three bedroom two bath. That increases the value dramatically. And the reason being is everyone searches online. So if most people say, oh, well, I need two baths, Greg. And so when I set up their search, it's two baths or more, which means they're not even seeing the three bedroom, one bath house. Mm. And so those homes have such a reduced exposure that they sell for a big discount. Now, adding a bathroom on and doing an addition with foundation and all of that can prove time consuming and costly. But a lot of these older homes will have a large closet or a laundry room that leads out the side or something like that. And you can move the laundry under the kitchen counter or into a closet in the hallway or into a different area, but you can convert that room. You have to get permits and all of that, but because you're not adding on to the existing structure, you're simply repurposing existing square footage. Mm -hmm. You can take that and make it into a bathroom a lot of these homes have raised foundations, which allow guys like you to come in and move all the pipes underneath in the crawl space. Um, and now you've gone from 3-1 to 3-2, and right away you have a larger market for that home. The buyer pool has expanded dramatically. What do you think about um, finishing out the garage and making that a dual space? So you can still park your car, but you could, you could set up a, a, a work area where you can, during the day, you can do your office stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, really wise and, and very straightforward because usually the garage, maybe you have a wallboard sheetrock, uh, you know, on the walls, but half the time you just have the open garage to the studs. That's right. So coming in and putting in a, a sub panel for the electric and running some wiring so you can set that all up is pretty straightforward. Um, and that's great because uh, one, it's that extra room. So you can say, hey, three bedroom, two bath, but we have a converted garage, which can be used as an office. And that may bring in that buyer who, well, has a long driveway. The, the garage is in the back. So I can park four cars in the driveway and it's California. It never rains here. Right. Um, you know what? I, 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 can, I can look at this home. Whereas before I might have just uh, selected it out. So it, it can be, and also it, 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 with the ADU uh, increase coming in, you now have it partially converted where mm -hmm. it becomes that much easier. Now you're just running plumbing because it's already set up with the yep. other. Um, so I think that's a really good idea. Um, it's a multi-purpose space or a multi-use space. I call them flex spaces. Yeah. The more flex space you have, the more buyers you can appeal to. You, you know, most I've seen, um, I've seen people just, just even with simple wallboard, they'll put the kids in there. They'll make mm -hmm. like a like a rumpus room for the kids mm -hmm. because you know kids they go they go bouncing off the wall when you give them the mountain <laughs> So yeah, I, you know, it's 420 square feet, pretty quick. Right. You know, absolutely. Average garage, 450, 420 square feet. So, mm -hmm. all right. So where do you, what do you see the trend of, uh, I think you answered that a little bit before, but what do you see the trends for ADUs slash casitas um, in the beach cities or most of Manhattan Redondo? You they're see gonna, them going up? I think they're going to increase dramatically. I think uh, the South Bay is kind of behind the curve that's happening in LA right now, but it's going to come because the state's requiring more housing. Yeah. 
Okay. So you're going to see a lot of garage conversions. Um, but having said that, I think that will also keep inventory rather low because I think a lot of folks are going to say, rather than looking to buy a larger home, why don't we just remodel our existing or add some space or convert our garage and then we don't have to move. Yep. And so there'll be more, uh, more of that for sure. You know, a lot of people on that same note, a lot of people don't realize that if they keep the exact, they keep the garage, mm -hmm. you can actually build a second story on, the, on most garages by mm -hmm. retrofitting the foundation. Right. So you don't have to lose the garage. And then you have the space. And you have the space. So if you were to, let's say, upgrade the garage, put some insulation, put AC in there, maybe mm -hmm. put a window um, you could you could have it as your auxiliary room, mm -hmm. and then have the second story, which is another four hundred square feet on top right. of it. You know, absolutely. You can have your your like a studio apartment up there. Mm -hmm. So, what where are some of the the fixer properties? I mean, it seems like it's kind of harder and harder because there's a lot of people looking for them. But what in your in your um, experience, where have you where have you found them? Like what parts of of the South Bay? Well, you're gonna. It's those those 1945 to 1955 built. They're usually single story. They usually were built a three bedroom, one bath, or three bedroom, two bath homes. Typically, they were 11 to 1200 square feet. Most often, they had an addition at some point, mm -hmm. and they, you know, so you'll see a lot of 15 to 1600 square foot homes. But really, it's just one large addition on the back of the house. And so sometimes it'll be a den, sometimes it'll be another bedroom or a, a kind of primary suite or master suite. Um, but those homes are going to be the ones that are the most ripe for a fixer upper opportunity. What really governs the fixer opportunities is the market itself. If the market's red hot, people are just happy to get any house. And so if they're fa facing 20, 30 offers everywhere they go, okay, this one needs a ton of work, but my brother knows a guy and, you know, maybe we can do this and we just have to get a home. Um, as the market cools, the fixer opportunities come back. So when you only have one or two buyers and people start shopping around a little bit more, now the fixer doesn't sell right away. Now they have to drop their price to get that property sold. So I think you're going to see more opportunity with that in the coming fall. Interesting. So what do you think, what, what would you say to, to people that say, hey, um, should I put off the sale of my house until next year? Should I sell now? They're, they're kind of on the fence. I think I think in a in a volatile market or mm -hmm. the volatility kind of makes people freeze. Well, I, if there isn't a governing life situation for you, right. that, that means you have to sell or, you know, for me, it's better to sell next year because my new office isn't open yet. Um, if it's just a matter of, you know, we're looking to downsize and you do have those sellers, uh, maybe empty nesters and we're looking to downsize. We don't need as much house. Um, when should we do it? I think it's a great time to do it now. I think there's still a bit of uncertainty as we head into the fall and into next year. As we discussed earlier, there are a lot of economic conditions at play and it could stay where it's increasing slightly. And you say, well, I'll hold it. It might go up another 3%. But if they increase the, uh, the interest rate another two times uh, beyond what we're thinking, all of a sudden the market starts to decline. A lot of people will say, I want to sell at the highest point or I want to buy at the lowest point. And what I'll often tell people is the only way you know that you bought at the lowest point is in hindsight. Sure. When you look back and you say, oh, now it's going up, that was the lowest point. That's right. But then you've missed it. So I think, you know, we have hit kind of the crescendo. I think the, the appreciation rate will slow as we go through 2022, but it's a really good time. Rates are still affordable. Yes, they're higher than they're insanely low 3.5 or 3 percent that we saw <laughs> but uh five to five and a half is still not a historically bad rate um, as i mentioned in 2004 and five people are tripping over themselves to get a rate like that no it's true it's true it's just it it's it's crazy you know obviously being in in the construction business and having the perspective of time mm -hmm. it's it's an amazing thing to see a house a house in Hawthorne that's the same size, same size house in Hawthorne, seven hundred fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. Same size house in in uh, in Carson, about the same price. And then you you hop over to Manhattan Beach, and it's one point eight, one point mm -hmm. seven million. And 
and um, or even even in Redondo. So mm-hmm. maybe it's not one point seven; it's one point two, one point three. And you ask yourself, higher than that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Th- that was maybe uh, yeah. six months ago's yeah. price, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so you ask yourself, like, okay, we're gonna buy we're gonna buy this house at one point three, one point four, mm-hmm. and it's hammered. Like it needs it needs another four, right? You know, I I, I think. I don't know. I think a lot of people. I don't know if I don't. I'll be honest with you. I don't even know if people realize that it it could take four hundred thousand mm-hmm. to bring it to where you're not stuff isn't breaking every five or six months. Mm-hmm. But but um, it, it's it's a very weird environment. I don't know that we've been we've been there where the money the the price for the capital is so cheap that it entices you, mm-hmm. but the price of the actual house is so so expensive and the, and the cost of construction is the highest it's ever been. Mm-hmm. It, 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 I mean, the cost for rebuilding a bathroom or a kitchen is so much higher now than it was in 2007 mm-hmm. all the way through to, well, I mean, I think by 2010 people were getting the best deal in construction. We we're, we're all like hanging around begging for work. <laughs> right. Like, Hey, can you fix that? Can I fix your fence? Hey, can I right. fix it? You know? So it's a very different dynamic. And I, you know, I, I don't know. What are your, what are your well, thoughts about I, that? I think, you know, when you bring in your construction team and, um, you know, if someone out there, they buy a home and, and they call in Bay Cities and they say, hey, come on in there. I tell my buyers, you're buying the location. That's why the one house is 750 and the other one's 1. 1.4 or 1. 1.8. And it's pretty much the same exact house. It's the level of desirability. You're buying in a neighborhood that everyone wants to live in and it doesn't, they don't build up. There's, you know, uh, 30, 32 feet or something like that. Right height restriction. So there are only so many of them. There really aren't that many empty lots in the main cities these days. No. Um, there aren't massive track homes being built anywhere here. So you're buying a very valuable piece of land. And what you can do is work with your construction team to put it into what I call a tier system. Like, hey, we can't do everything right away, Greg. Okay, well, why don't you get in there and do the plumbing and the electric? Live with the data kitchens and bathrooms for right now. You can dress it up with some paint and decoration. Sure. Look at what staging can do to a house that's for sale. You can do the same thing in your own home and then make a plan. Okay, next year we're going to have them come in and we're going to have them do the bathrooms. And then the year after we're going to blow out the kitchen. And you can spread it out where it's not so overwhelming that you can get that great deal on that house and have your construction crew dialed in with a plan to get it all done uh, rather than simply say, you know, I guess I'll continue renting because then you really lose out because that 1.8, 10 years from now, you know, could be 2.5 or 2.6 or more. Yep. And all the money you put into it, you get back and then some, and you realize, wow, that was the best investment I made. Um, and I'm so glad that I, I worked with my, my guys to get it done in a way that I could afford. I, I think that that's definitely good advice. It, it really when you when you look at where prices were in my neighborhood, there was a house for sale for four hundred fifty thousand, mm-hmm. little tiny house. Bad, bad, as far as where it was in the, in, in the neighborhood, it was on a on the corner lot, tiny little mm-hmm. front yard, tiny side yard, no backyard, and the house is still one one point two. And I would if you would have told me, hey, that house is going to sell for one point two million dollars in mm-hmm. ten years, I'd be like, there's no way, mm-hmm. there's no way. Right. So you you really can't you really can't predict how what it's what it's going to be or how good or how how I don't know you can also can't predict how bad obviously but but um I, to your point i think that with time on your side mm-hmm. um most people will do well i've talked to sellers who say oh you know they were the guy across the street was selling for this is going back a few years 600,000 and it's oh that home will never be a million dollars i said i guarantee it'll be a million dollars it's just a matter of when mm-hmm. As to your point, time. And so we know that you, you know, the, the, because it's so scarce, if you look at the devaluation of the dollar over time, so uh, what's $10,000 in 1980 as compared to now, um, homes have gone up in value, even if you use, and you can Google this, it's a really cool little thing. If you look at, hey, okay, when was this home last sold? It sold in 1985 for X amount. Well, what's that in today's dollars? And then you do that. And then you look at what it's selling for. It's gone up about six to seven times the devaluation of the dollar. And that's yeah. because of scarcity and increase in population. And there are no more of these lots. So 
they'll all go up in value. You may have down markets where they drop for a couple of years, but 10, 20, 30 years from now, it will be higher in price than it is now yeah. and substantially so. I sold a house in Venice, to your point, a house in Venice. We sold it for six twenty five. dollars mm-hmm. It was the highest. The, it, it, I was like, this house, I mean, let's sell it right now. Mm-hmm. We're, this, this is never going to be. There was like, right. I think there was like, there was some like projects house. You know how Venice mm-hmm. is. There's some projects kind right. of scattered all over the place and kind of some, you know, Venice has always been kind of a sketchy place. Right. And uh, I thought to my, I told my partner at the time, like, hey man, uh, we got, we got an offer. We, we didn't make a whole lot of money in the deal because we had to do a lot of improvements. Mm-hmm. But, but um, when we, we got, we got an offer for, I think it was 620 or 650, something like that. I was like, hey, let's sell this and run. Mm-hmm. That house is worth like a mil nine. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like that now. When I first started in 2003, I remember looking and uh, I was looking at a four unit in Venice and it was right off of Abbot Kinney and they wanted like 450. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's high. 450,000. Yeah. Really? I don't that's know if like, I can make the rents work. It's like 3 million plus sure, right now. Sure. You know, um, and it didn't, and it doesn't have to pencil now and people buy them because they're parking money, right. you know, and they have money come from my other investments and they're like, let's just keep it in something safe that gives us a little return that we know it's going to go up over time. But you really can't go wrong with buying real estate. The people who make a ton of money in real estate, they buy and they hold. And then when they have more money, they buy something else or they'll leverage one to buy another one. Mm-hmm. Um, you can flip. But when you flip, you have to have everything dialed in and you have to uh, be aware because if the market shifts, you can get caught with that. It's, it's not easy. We, we did uh, successfully in between 2000 and between 2006, uh, 2004, 2004 and 2007, mm-hmm. we flipped about 14 Yeah, and we, we only lost money. I consider losing money. We broke even, but... Mm. Um, on one, mm-hmm. on one, but I'll tell you when the market turned, it was like it turned in quickly. It was the last house that we sold was in Corona, All right? And I think we sold it. We got an offer. We had on, we had it listed for three twenty, mm-hmm. which was a lot of money back then. And um, my partner was like, "Well, hey, let's leave it on there. Maybe we can get three fifty. Let's see if we can get another offer." And I said, right. "Listen, man, let's give this guy fifteen grand back mm-hmm. and let's close this thing right now." Right. So we closed it. Within six months, that neighborhood was two thirty. Mm-hmm. Within six months, mm-hmm. hundred thousand dollar loss right. within six months. So we we got out of there. We made uh, I think we made you know, twenty five thirty thousand bucks on that, which was well, not, it's not bad. We I think we had it for three months. Mm-hmm. But um, it's a it's a different world. Short term flipping right. versus holding for for the long. Yeah, term. but most most uh, homeowners are are looking at you know a minimum of three. Most of them are five to five seven. Eight, yeah, five to seven. Uh, and then some far longer than that. And so, um, if you're getting into a home, if it's in a good neighborhood, and you like the home, make a plan. You don't have to fix everything at once. Fix the things that you need to first, and that's usually the systems. Right. People go right for the kitchen or the bathroom. Fix your electric first. 100%. Fix your plumbing first. Fix your roof first. Live with the data. Make a whole look with it if you need to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can get to that. And as you get to it over time, you're just increasing the value and increasing the value and increasing the value. Um, and, it, yeah, you'll find it's really worthwhile. I agree. Well, thanks very much for, for joining us. If you want to learn more, folks, uh, you can visit Greg uh, Roberts at uh, gregrobertsproperties.com. Mm-hmm. And his number's on there. We'll also uh, put a little um, post uh, below on, on the show. Guys, it's our 18th birthday. We did 18 wow. years last month. Congratulations! We made it. We made it. Through, we made it through the crash, and and uh, we made it through the pandemic. So here we are. Hey guys, in celebration of our uh, of our birthday, we're giving you 20 percent off our interior design service. So you buy 10 hours with uh, Wendy, we'll give you 12, and uh, she'll help you uh, design your kitchen or bathroom and help you pick out some cool stuff for your place. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you like and subscribe. Leave a comment. It makes the show fun and interactive. Last week, we had a uh, good friend, Josie Balzano. So if you haven't, if you didn't check out that episode, check out episode 57. She talked about uh, real estate up in PV. We talked this week. We uh, covered mostly down here by the beach cities. Hey, guys. We've been in business for a long time. This is our little license number. This is what we do. We do interior design, architectural engineering. We'll represent you with the city. We'll manage your project. 
make sure that uh, we build you a quality uh, new space and remodel the space you have now. So remember, guys, this is The Construction Show. My name is Alex Rodriguez. I want to welcome you, and thank you for visiting with us. And uh, till next week, see ya. This is My California. My California. And My California. And there are simple adjustments we can all make to save water every day. By taking shorter showers. Watering our lawns between dusk and dawn. And checking for broken sprinkler heads once a month. That's That's how how I I conserve My California. California. Take advantage of CalWater rebates and programs at calwater.com slash conservation. Alex Rodriguez reminding you, you don't need a contract, you need a team of pros.